Hello and welcome to Unboxing. Today, uh, my sparring partner is Cameron Bancroft, which I'm very excited about. Cameron Bancroft is a um, professional cricketer uh, who's represented the Australia national team, including in two Ashes series. Uh, he also plays for the Perth Scorchers, um, Western Australia, and last year um, was appointed as captain for Durham County Cricket Club here in the UK. Um, there was a very pivotal moment that happened in sort of Cam's life and career, um, which happened in March 2018, where Cam was caught up in a, um, an incident where he was found to be complicit in tampering with the ball, um, which a lot of you will probably be aware of. Uh, and, and it was found to be an attempt that wasn't within the laws of the game. Um, Shortly after this happened, Cam took full accountability and responsibility for the incident and was subsequently banned for um, nine months from uh, all sort of international cricket. The incident was pretty, a pretty big incident, in, especially in Australia and especially in the cricketing world and, and sort of sparked a, a public outcry in terms of and really put the magnifying glass onto the Australian cricket culture and sort of cricket culture as a whole. Um, and sort of two years on, that's really been looked at as a kind of before and after moment where the Australian cricket culture changed. Um, and this has actually been documented in, a, in an Amazon Prime series um, called The Test. Um, reflecting on this in the student more recently um, in interviews and, and a few articles, sort of Cam started to sort of open up and talk more about how the incident sparked quite a big sort of personal transformational journey for him. Um, speaking particularly about how it sort of, he went from wanting to just fit into a culture to wanting to be more true to himself and, and be authentic. So it's really that kind of theme that I'm, I'm keen to really dive a bit more deeper into today and uh, kind of what the journey camp's been on. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, um, please welcome to the ring, Cameron Bancroft. Cam, Thanks for having me. I think you're the first guest we've got from uh, from all the way in Australia. So uh, good Very old, fortunate. good old Zoom. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I just I, I always like to kick off these bouts. Um, probably seemed like a fa fairly random kind of link. Um, yeah, just uh, sent out a cold email to get you on the get you in the ring. But it was actually through a friend um, that I played with. So back at, back in my uni days, I played a bit. Uh, I actually played uh, one, two first class games in cricket um, where I was punching well above my weight. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, I probably have one of the highest bowling averages in first class cricket ever <laughs> with, uh, with 158. But um, yeah, my, my captain when I was at, uh, when I was at Durham Uni playing, um, now he's a pro cricketer at Durham County Cricket Club. Um, chap called Cam Steele. Um, yeah, and we were we were just having a having a little chat about who'd be a good person to to unbox in the cricket world, and uh, and your name came up pretty quickly. So yeah, so it's uh, awesome for him to uh, help me out on that. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for for coming in. But um, no worries. Look, I'd like I'd like to just yeah start off really with where it all started for you, like some of your earliest memories um, in regards to cricket. Like I imagine, you know, cricket's a, a massive sport in Australia, full stop. Um, so it'd be good to just, yeah, hear how, you know, your first memories of cricket, like was cricket always something that you wanted to do as an adult? Um, how did it sort of develop in those early days? Yeah, so um, I'm, I grew up in uh, Perth, Western Australia. Um, in a, a family, uh, I've got two two younger brothers, so um, they're uh, twenty and twenty five now. So we used to have good battles growing up um, in the backyard. Um, my dad spent a lot of time with me, you know, with my batting, um, grooving my my batting technique. It was something that he was uh, uh, not strict about, but uh, he was letter to the law, making sure that I had a good technique. I wasn't a very strong kid, so having a good technique and a good foundation was um, was important as a youngster. And then hopefully the older that I got and the stronger that I got, the more I'd be able to hit the ball. So um, a lot of a lot of memories uh, from cricket from that point of view with my dad. 
Um, I played other, lots of other sports um, growing up. AFL football is very popular in, in Australia. You probably wouldn't get a lot of it, maybe on BT Sport or something like that. But uh, I played footy um, and I played basketball as well. So I, I, I had a try with a, with a few things. I was always quite, uh, quite competitive no matter what sport I was playing. But um, definitely cricket. Um, cricket was the main one. My mum had a, a dancing academy for about 20 years. So um, dancing wasn't quite my thing. But um, uh, maybe I should have. Might have helped my footwork a little bit better. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that that's a bit of my upbringing um, with cricket and, and with, with sport growing up. It was definitely a, a really good one. Um, not too many bad memories um, at all there. Awesome. And then what, what kind of age was it where you started getting like to a point where people were like, okay, this guy could be really good. Like, was there a, was there a certain sort of age or time in the life where you, you kind of realized or other people realized? I think for me, um, I always loved the game. I trained really hard. I tried really hard. Um, I have batting coach um, growing up, Wayne Andrews, who used to feed lots of balls to me on the bowling machine. Um, and then I could always could always play, but I don't think I, I quite um, I quite flourished till I probably got to under thirteens or anything. I wasn't like one of those nine year old kids that you know just came out and dominated. I had to work hard for my runs, and I remember playing an under thirteens game, um, and I it was the first game of the season, and I think I got 80, 89 not out. And I remember that being a really pivotal moment for me as a kid because um, it was it was a game I actually don't really have a lot of memories of, but I do remember I had a song playing in my head from our school um, that day, and and I just uh, everything just flowed really really nicely, and that that game gave me a a lot of confidence, and uh, I do remember walking away from that particular game thinking that you know I had um, I'd, I'd put a lot of hard work in. Um, and it had sort of come through a little bit at the start of that season. So I had a much better year that year. And then um, I guess from there, obviously, consistency is always a constant battle in cricket. But from there, I was able to, I think, um, perform, at a, perform at a level where, um, you know, I, I felt like if I worked hard enough at, at this game, I might be able to um, get some success from it. That's, I, lo I love that story about the, the song. Is that something that you... You still do now? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's just... Uh, sometimes when now, if I get did in and you have a really good day... on purpose? Or was it just something that just happened that day? No. No, it was actually nothing that I, I... I don't even remember, you know, sitting down in the rooms before the game thinking, I'm going to just go out and sing a song in my head. Um, I think I was in primary school still at that time, so... You know, you go to music class and, you you know, you probably play around on instruments. The teacher might sing a song or something like that. And I think it was genuinely a really crap song like that that we did in music class. And it just played through my head for the entire inning. So, uh, um, do you think there's something... Yeah, in, funny story. Do you think there's something in that in that it, like, takes, takes, your, takes your mind off the things that you don't want to think about too much and just allows you to just kind of chill. I think that's what that moment a little bit was for me. It was just that um, ability to, to relax. Um, I, you know, I've always been a very uptight probably person. Um, hence why I've, I guess the older I've gotten, the more I have um, become drawn towards um, activities that, that look to that relax you. So, um, yeah, but as a kid, that was, yeah, I guess that's an interesting observation. It was just, uh, you know, I remember often hearing Glenn McGrath used to have a song playing in his head, um, when he was bowling. Um, and that, yeah, that particular day, I, I think I just had a song playing in my head and I was probably saying, watch the ball to myself, um, as the ball was running in and, um, yeah, you're able to get into one of those one of those zones, and I think that was probably one of the first times that I'd yeah. ever experienced that. So um, I think that's why it was quite memorable, even though it was a it was a 12 year old kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
no, some of those early memories can really stick out. So um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, like for you, obviously, for anyone that doesn't know, like Australian cricket, there's this kind of, when you play cricket for Australia, you get a baggy green cap and it sort of is known to stand for a lot, kind of has a lot of sentimental value. So I was just wondering, like when you were, you know, 13, 14, 15, starting to, you know, spend a lot of time playing cricket, was was watching the 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 pros and the Australian cricket team and them wearing their baggy green like a, was it a big thing like do you remember it being like a big thing for you like a big dream of maybe one day you being or playing or or really was it kind of just like actually I'm just going to play and I'll see what happens like was it was it a big lure for you that like baggy green cap uh yeah I think it was yeah it was a probably a bit of a an obsession at times um yeah i, I look I, sitting behind me right here i've i've got i've got a box full of cricket journals that i used to write in since i was probably about 11 10 11 years old and yeah. um, that's how seriously i took the game um you know i wanted to get all my thoughts down on a piece of paper and um you know i, I spent um yeah i would spend every waking day as a as a kid and a junior um yeah dreaming of of achieving that um so yeah I, I think in australia if you love the game of cricket you you know you love the 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 goal to chase of trying to earn a baggy green cap for yourself so it's um it was certainly one for me um you know there's different times where i've obsessed too much about it not just let go and and just enjoyed um, the game as opposed to, um, you know, really draining you because you want to achieve that. But um, yeah, definitely for me, I would be lying if I, I didn't say it was a really huge motivating factor as to why I played cricket. Yeah. What, what were in these cricket journals? Was that, would that just be like techniques or stuff or anything? Oh, geez. Um, I, I, I don't know. I actually think I might have one sitting right here next to me that I was I was pottering around in. No, that's a more current one. Um, that's a more current one. But I don't know. Like I, I would just I would just write anything down. Yeah. Anything down. And if I and if I saw things that were um, you know structured and meaningful that you know su other successful people did, I would I would use that because I felt like. If it was good enough for somebody else to do, it was good enough for me. Um, and now, you know, and and I wasn't, you know, I'd have days where, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write um, and things like that. But uh, more often than not, if I had thoughts going on in my mind, I would, I would write them down. Um, and I think it allowed me to, to have, um, you know, to to be able to get whatever was out of my head onto onto a piece of paper, and um, you know, I know that's a, a really healthy thing to do, but you know, ultimately, I heard that that's what um, you know really successful players did. So um, I tried to try to use any little extra thing that I could to to get ahead. Yeah. Do you class yourself as someone who is like? There's obviously this big debate about you know, talent v how hard you work and like how much you get out of yourself. Like, do you class yourself as maybe someone who's getting the most out of his talent or do you class yourself as someone who's pretty talented and, you know, was always destined to be at that level? Like, how do you see that debate and where do you, where do you think you lie in the scale? Um, well, look, I think if you, if you get to you know if if you get to to any any sort of level really you've you've got to have 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 some talent um but there's no doubt that um you know to you know to get to the to be the very best you've got to put in work as well you know people can be very talented and, and still not not achieve things that perhaps people other people might say that their potential could be but um I'm not sure if I have a percentage to put on it, but there's there's no doubt that they both both contribute. Definitely, I feel. And like, were you? Because obviously, like writing cricket journals, like it's probably not the normal thing to do. I don't know. Maybe it is in Perth, but like, I guess for like the teenage talented cricketer, like 
that that would almost you know people could maybe joke about that or like you know laugh laugh at them in the dressing room like hey, this guy writes a cricket journal like have you just been always you just didn't really care about that sort of stuff you just kind of like do it and talk about it openly or did you do it more in private how how did how did you sort of go about your business in that way oh, i i don't i don't think i voiced um you know oh, every, everyone i'm writing in a cricket journal <laughs> i don't think i ever went out to to voice that it was something that i was doing to my teammates or anything like that but yeah um you know if someone asked me i definitely would you know say that you know this is something that i this is something that i i do um and i certainly yeah certainly not not ashamed for it i think um i think my teammates would be the first to admit that they you know that they accept that i'm a little bit different definitely at times um so i guess you know i think perhaps maybe a little bit you, you probably feel a little bit self-conscious about things like that but um it's i think the the wiser you become and the more accepting you become in your own skin the more yeah. um you, you accept your own um you know quirkiness i guess a little bit so that's certainly a quirky trait of mine yeah well i'm sure we'll get onto it later but i like when i watched the the, the test documentary like it's clear that I don't know what it was before, but like after, you know, your incident and everything, like it's, it's clear the culture is very much more like be yourself and, you know, do your, do your slightly, you know, quirky things that, that you like to do, like whether that's, you know, make coffee in the mornings or, or whatever. But yeah, I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll get onto that in, in a bit. But, um, but yeah, so just moving on a little bit sort of past those early days. So you obviously, um, did you kind of go straight into cricket like after school and then how did it, if you want to just like sort of summarize how it worked through kind of progressing through the ranks in terms of like how you got to getting to the stage where you were actually going to be awarded um, a, a cap, a, a baggy green cap for Australia. Yeah. So um, I went to uh, Qantas college in Perth, um, which um yeah, which is a yeah, great great school, um, particularly for for sport. Um, so I was extremely fortunate um, to yeah be able to. I think a, quite a lot of the players in our state cricket team all went to um, like a group of private schools in Perth, and you uh, you tend to play a lot against each other. Um, so it was it was actually a really great competition to play in. So th that was that was my high school. Um, I was yeah I was an was an average average student I think at school I got the job done um, but for me it was about at that stage it was definitely about about playing cricket so you know schoolwork uh, fitted around you know the preparation to yeah hopefully get a back of green one day and that was training and that was you know work on my fitness and all those sorts of things so um, yeah that that was that were my days at school um, which were awesome fun. Uh, and then I guess through sort of the, the ranks in, in, in the systems that we have in Australia, I honestly couldn't have, I couldn't have followed a pathway um, to getting into, I feel the Australian team any better, you know, um, cricket Australia put in pathways to, you know, I guess, identify talent, identify players. And, and I feel like I followed, I followed that to an absolute T. I, I played um, state under 15s and then I played, couple of years 17s couple of years in 19s um i played aussie under 19s in my age group when i was 18 um got involved in the in the junior pathways you know your your stints that you have at the cricket academy and things like that um and i guess worked my way to to playing state cricket for for western australia um and you know it i guess by saying it like that it sounds rosy and it sounds like um you know it was easy but you know there were definitely a lot of challenges along the way um you know i didn't go into state cricket and just play straight away in the test team um you know i had to score runs in state cricket for a few years and then um when yeah when the time was right and when i was doing the right things at the right time i um got an opportunity to to play for australia which was fantastic so um yeah look I, it's it's great isn't it but um you know you'd always like to You'd always like to achieve more. Um, so, you know, whilst I'm very proud of 
um, those things that I've achieved to now, um, you know, I certainly would like to, uh, would like to, to get back to back in, into that side. Cause, um, you know, it's awesome fun. It's a great honor to be able to you know, represent your country. Of course. Yeah. Awesome. So, so yeah, so you obviously, you say I, I'm interested in, you say like obviously it was hard like there were challenges like coming up through those ranks like did you feel do you feel like your personality was like really tested like during those years like in terms of or did you feel like you were kind of getting enough performances getting enough runs so that it like wasn't tested as much or would you say that there was like some pretty tough moments in those kind of like early days of you know playing Sheffield Shield in uh, in Australia, like how how tough would you say it was on the kind of on the character on the personality? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, definitely very testing. Um, you know, for me, the the biggest thing that I had to learn um, was was to to relax to relax more. You know, physically and and mentally. Um, and um, you know, I think after my first Shield season, I got, um, yeah, I probably deserved to get dropped really in the second half of the season. I got, I think, scored about 40 runs in four, five games, um, managed to somehow still play in a Shield final. Um, I got three ducks in a row, I think, at one stage uh, in that period. So, you know, and I and I tried so hard. Like, I did everything. Everything that you can imagine, I, I would have tried to... Um, you know, to try and get myself to play better. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time there. That was a big challenge. Um, and then after after that season, I I was able to I, I played quite quite well for a couple of seasons. You know, cricket's a game where you're you're always going to go through phases where um, you know you miss out, um, and particularly opening the batting in, in shield cricket, it's you know it's a tough spot to bat. So, um, you know, I grant that. Um, you know, even in even in junior days, um, I had definitely moments where I wasn't as consistent as as what I'd what I'd like to be. Um, you know, I remember getting getting dropped for a couple of games in uh, in an under nineteen series, um, Australian under nineteen series, and I was you know pretty gutted because I hadn't really experienced that a lot. But I do know that um, you know my, my personality definitely is to you know, to probably have, probably have a whinge like everybody else and then uh, get, your, get yourself back on the horse. You know, what can I actually control? What can I do? And, um, you know, to be fair to myself, I, I think I handle, I handle those things, um, you, know, well, you know, quite well. I might go down the wrong path to, with the intention of it coming out the other side positively. Um, but I think, you know, that's all part of the wisdom that you um, learn from making, making mistakes. And, you know, I've I've definitely um, yeah I've definitely had a lot of failures in in my career and um, but that also that also wouldn't I wouldn't have learnt the lessons I guess without them. Awesome. So yeah, talk to me about then getting this getting the call up. Um, like, how does it actually work? Is it just you know a simple simple phone call to you know be told that you're going to get? So you, you to just um, for anyone who doesn't know, Cameron's first test cap was actually in an Ashes series I, I believe it was at Brisbane um at the Gabba um you know it doesn't really get much bigger than that um, in terms of you know a cricket match um first test in Australia um at the Gabba so yeah just talk me through how that happened like what was the you know the phone call like how did it feel like you spoke you spoke about like your dad you know going through the technique with you as a young kid it must have been a pretty proud moment for him so how did that sort of sink in and what what were the overwhelming feelings when you sort of got that call up yeah um absolutely absolutely ecstatic really um i i actually i actually wish that i allowed myself to enjoy the moment a little bit more um i i played a couple of really um, really good games for Western Australia. Um, played really well against New South Wales in a game, and then I um, I got a double hundred against South Australia. And after that game, I um, yeah I had I had a couple of missed calls on my phone. Uh, Justin Langer, who was coaching WA at the time, actually said to um, 
go and check your phone. So he obviously knew something that was up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, gave, gave a phone call back to um, Trevor Hones, who was the, the coach at the time. Uh, sorry, the chairman of selectors, um, still is. And um, yeah, gave, gave me the news. So um, yeah, pretty, very, very exciting. Um, yeah, I, I wish I'd allowed myself to enjoy it, enjoy it more because, um, you know, I think I, I think I denied myself a little bit the, the ability to enjoy it because, um, you know, whilst it was great to get the phone call, I still knew that I had, I had a job at hand to do. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, um, you know, even, even just with your family and, and things like that, where you, you embrace and you, you share those proud moments, you know, no doubt they were proud of me, but I was, so focused on wanting to achieve good things wearing the hat as opposed to just getting it that um i I just don't think i enjoyed enjoyed the moment as as more fully as i could have but um still nonetheless like extremely proud um and and certainly one moment that i'll um yeah i'll cherish closely yeah yeah i was going to ask about that like obviously you would have watched so when you were i think we're sort of similar age but when you were, you know, growing up playing a lot of cricket, there must have been, you know, the Justin Langers, the the Matt Haydens, these like greats of the game playing for Australia and like scoring, you know, bucket loads of runs, um, smashing the English. Um, and that's a massive, you know, they're massive boots to fill and they're like it, it, really tough acts to follow. Like, was there also a sense of, like how worthy do you do you think you felt of obviously you've been playing well and you don't your plates, but was that like the overriding feeling is like you're not worthy of it until you're 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 achieving like the kind of runs that that they did and stuff like is there is there a, is there that sense of like huge expectation especially at, at that time like with how well the team's played in the past like is that a big weight of expectation on you and did you did you feel that? Yeah, I, I, th- I think I've grown up, um, you know, with with, you know, parents that, you know, worked really really hard for, you know, for for myself and my two brothers really, and you know they worked really really hard, and um, you know sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that you're guaranteed, you know, success straight away, and and I think um, my parents both made me feel very grounded always about that. Um, and definitely coming through the ranks, you know, I can remember playing, you know, grade cricket for, for, for my um, local club side, Williton. Um, you know, I think I was quite young. I was about 15 when I played my first A grade game for Williton. And, um, you know, I, I, I played with a very senior cricket team that were quite successful. And, and I felt like they, they really preached standards of, you know, you got to work really hard and, and you know you've got to earn respect, and um, the same when I when I played for Western Australia, and and I um, you know I I might have been a young young kid on the block, but you know this young kid you've got to you got to work hard and you've got to earn respect from us, and that means to to perform, you know that means to, I guess perform really really well, and um, you know it might not always be the greatest way to think because you can. Um, subconsciously maybe put pressure on yourself and um, you know that that might make you just tighten up a little bit in your body and in your arms and your technique and things like that so um, whilst it may not be the greatest way to to um, I think I think it's really important to respect may it be the greatest way to think particularly if it doesn't allow you to relax but um, it's how I felt about when I um, yeah got my got my call up to play test cricket for Australia. I was like, this is great. This is fantastic. But, you know, I've got to earn respect from, from my teammates. And, um, yeah. you know, that means performing well, regardless of whether I've just scored 200 in a game or I've got a couple of 50s in a game. Um, you know, no doubt, um, I, you know, my teammates were very supportive of me. And um, I, definitely, I definitely felt that. But, you know, in my own mind, because... You know, this is what I've done before in the past. I, I just, I felt this great, um, yeah, I just felt this great importance that I had to earn my, you know, earn respect from, from my teammates. Yeah. 
No, it's just really interesting that you you pick up on that and also like uh, at all levels like it's uh, I've experienced you know coming into new teams and like I went to South Africa for a couple of months last year and I joined a new cricket club and like it's such a big desire to like fit in with the people around you and just not be just that outsider who's like rocking up for a couple of games and just filling in the the, the team like I think anyone who's played cricket can can understand that 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 just pressure that kind of just desire to fit in and be part of a of a group um you know going together so yeah so on that topic like how well did you know the, the australian squad at the time like had you played with a lot of the players or were you like totally fresh into meeting some of the guys like before playing like how 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 well did how sort of comfortable was it like in those early early days yeah, I, I was I was fine. Um, I'd come across a lot of the guys in state cricket anyway um, in the you know the the seasons beforehand. So um, yeah, I felt comfortable to to chat to and to be around um, to be around those guys. Some some players I hadn't hadn't played a lot with or spent a lot of time with, but um, for majority it was it was really it was really fine. Um, honestly, it was good. Um, you always, yeah, you're always excited when you get into get into an Australian an Australian cricket team. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to perform for the team, but also I wanted to, you know, I wanted my teammates to look at me and go, you know, this bloke's going to get the job done for us, regardless of if, um, you know, there's many other experienced players around me. Um, that that's something that I wanted to. I wanted to do it for myself. I mean, it was great. Sean Marsh, who um, is a teammate of mine for WA, he was he was playing in that Test match, so he's a familiar face. It was he was someone that I um, yeah was really proud to to play with in my first game. Um, his dad Jeff uh, presented my cap, so um, yeah, there were familiar faces around, and um, I think um, yeah, I, I certainly felt 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 comfortable. Yeah. And so that how that game developed. Um, I did was doing a bit of badgering on Crick Info the other day. <laughs> so you you won the Aussies won that first test, I believe, um, quite convincingly, and you scored quite quite decent, like eighty odd in the second innings. So how how did that feel? Like you know, debut for test debut for Australia, Ashes series. You've just hit you know winning runs. Did you sort of feel like you arrived? Did you feel like you were you were on top of the world at that point. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think I felt like I'd arrived at all. Um, I, I, you know, I was definitely pleased that I, I bounced back from from the first innings. Um, and yeah, I was just really happy to contribute. Um, I think that was. I think that was the. You know that that was the thing that I wanted. I just wanted to contribute to the team and to um, and to play my role. So, you know that the second innings was was great. That was a big tick for me, and uh, you know I took a lot of confidence away away from that. But yeah, um, you know definitely would have liked to have um, done it a few more times um, for the rest of that series. I, I definitely gave myself opportunities. I just didn't quite didn't quite um, go on with it, but. Um, you know, they, they were the lessons that I, I definitely learned learned from that time. Awesome. So just, yeah, jumping forward, I guess, a little bit now. So I don't know how long it was between that point and the incident in, in March 2018, I guess roughly a year and a half or something like that. No, like, not even. Like not even that. A month. A year. couple of months. Oh, was it, was it actually just that winter or like the next? Yeah, so it wasn't, wasn't yeah. too long. So I think... So it would be fair to say that in that time since making your debut to the to the incident, I think you you probably had some up and down performances. Didn't like fully like um, like solid consolidate your place in the side. Like few few decent performances, few low ones. Um, so yeah, just um, if if you could just yeah describe like sort of that the the path to getting to that moment, and then like maybe a little bit about you know how. how how this like culture that developed that 
that allowed an incident like that to take place? Like, were there any key sort of, like, because obviously looking, looking back on that incident, a lot's been said about it was the, the culture that was the issue. And, um, you know, that was what led to um, some, some mistakes being made on sort of an individual level. But, yeah, if you could just sort of maybe summarise kind of what was going on generally, like, in the dressing room, was it, was it led by, like, this just really strong desire to win? Um, you know, what, what, what would you say was the culture that, that caused that to happen? And, and how is your sort of, how are you fitting into that, that culture? Yeah, I look at the time. Um, I, I could have been touch and go, really, going on that tour to South Africa. Um, and yeah, I think when you're in the Australian cricket team, you get scrutinized pretty heavily. So, um, whether you play well, or you don't play well. So for me, um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get some, get some scores on the board, um, to hopefully, um, you know, nail my spot down a little bit more and, and, you know, to be fair, um, you know, I felt like I was beginning to really do that in that series. Um, you know, it was quite a, it's incredible series, really. Um, yeah, yeah, it, was. it was, it was very competitive. Um, you know, there was a lot of fire and a lot of energy, you know, um, you know, South Africa play you know, really strong cricket. So, um, and so do we, so it was, it was actually, um, you know, probably quite enjoyable for, for fans to watch really. Um, it was certainly enjoyable to play in, but it was really, really tough. So, um, you know, I, I, I was able to, um, you know, to get get some scores. I, I didn't didn't go and get any big hundreds or anything like that, like I, I desired to do. But um, I, I improved a lot, and um, that gave me a lot of confidence. You know, even in the the Cape Town game, I, in the first innings, I think um, I got seventy odd, and it was probably one of the best knocks that I played. And I only got only made seventy. Um, you know, a lot of areas of my game, you know, I felt like really came out yep. in that innings that I'd improved a lot. So, you know, from that from that point of view, you talk about earning respect from your from your teammates, and 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 I certainly felt like I was I was beginning I was beginning to do that. Um, you know, um, and and I and I guess like at the end of the day, you know, professional sport is about winning. You know, when you when um, I think when obviously when we make when we make mistakes, particularly um, the, you know the bad mistake that we we did make um, in in Cape Town in that in that match, like you um, you know it doesn't it doesn't become about about winning anymore. You know the game becomes more humbling than what what it is. But I think in the heat of the heat of the battle, um, you know it is it is about that. So. I think your professional sport, you're definitely constantly toing and froing between, um, you know, doing what you can to, to, to win, to win, but also, um, I guess be, you know, be respected as, as a cricket team as well. And, um, yeah, we, we just in that particular moment, um, yeah, made a, made a really poor, poor, poor decision and, uh, you know, it resulted, it resulted in the way that it did, but um, you know, I, I think, I think the culture of our cricket team um, was was okay, um, but it definitely um, brought about an opportunity for for growth, and and I think that's that's definitely how, as a as a country, I think we've taken it from there, and, and that's exactly the way, the way you know, I think that's been the the blessing, I guess, that's come out of it. So. Um, you know those those challenges bring about great opportunities, and and that's where that's where we are now. Yeah, I think that's a yeah really well said because I think it was yeah, obviously when an incident like that happens and like the media's you know going off on one, it's very easy to you know point fingers at all you individuals and and your team in particular and be like oh my god you know they're so evil you know they're they're doing things that we'd never do but and I think some of the things that you've talked about in terms of like wanting to fit in and be respected by your teammates everyone wanting to win like desperately I think there's a lot of cricket teams like around in club level around the world or 
or whatever level who've you know probably done something that if they were really put under the microscope probably wouldn't be as proud of but you know they've done it and oftentimes you get away from it so not to say that any of these things are right it's just like you know people aren't all angels and this is happening on a much you know bigger more ubiquitous level um than than i think people realize so obviously it was as you say like it 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 did come out and it was it was a great opportunity for growth um in the end which is i think what clearly what the you know aussie team has, has done with it which is which is pretty cool to see um but yeah talk, so talk to me about you know this this incident um particularly and like it, it's happened and you know it must have all you know in your in your mind obviously looking back it's probably a much bigger mistake than it seemed at the time but um how did that how did that feel like in that first 24 hours that first 48 hours of like real like sort of coming to the realization of of what was the was the test actually abandoned or was it did it i can't remember actually what what happened to the test but how did that yeah how did that actually feel on like a personal level like the feelings of of guilt of shame like what was the what was the overriding emotions going on um yeah uh um geez uh what was the feeling um i was pretty lost to be honest um it's pretty rattled um there it, it obviously was was a big deal and um you know at, at the time you don't really um if, if anyone's equipped to handle a situation like that put your hand up because uh you know at the time you obviously you you acknowledge in, in a dressing room you know a, a mistake um and then i guess having to to manage that from then onwards that's that's huge so um you know so many emotions are flying around in that um at that particular point but um yeah yeah look um i think um what was the rest of the question i kind of kind of forgot yeah, a little no, bit like, so what um did like what actually happened with the game like did, oh yeah we lost the game um the game did carry on did it was that the last yes. day i think the game might have been done probably yeah actually it might have been done the next day yeah <laughs> memory gone yeah 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 it was it was gone yeah look i i've i've lived all of those all of those moments in my mind uh yeah, a thousand times before. I can imagine it, but uh, yeah, I I wanted to just kind of get yeah a bit of an insight into in terms of like, do you think the fact that kind of you were in that position to you know take take on that responsibility to be part of it? Do you think in a way like you that was kind of a it was kind of you'd been given like re some responsibility as like a, kind of a more maybe respected member of the dressing room to like take on that responsibility. I was just, what I'm trying to get to is sort of, do you feel like it was kind of meant to happen to you in a way r rather than maybe another member of the dressing room? Like, do you think that's, that's just part of your character to like kind of want to put your hand up and, you know, maybe take, take things on for the team, like lead from the front in a way? Yeah, I think I definitely, I definitely felt felt at the time that that's what, um, you know, that the duty to, yeah, um, to tamper with the cricket ball was my, um, yeah, it was, it was my way that I could contribute, you know, outside of scoring runs. So, um, it's it's not right, but at the time it seemed right because, uh, you know, otherwise um, I would have been more true to myself and and said no. But at the time I. I didn't have the the wisdom points in the bank to to make a decision. You, call, you say that I'm a fool, and you know you're probably right. Like I probably am a fool, but there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is, and it presented um, you know more opportunities for me to you know to better myself as a person. And you know, I knew that I made a mistake. I, I went into I went into the um, umpires' chain rooms, and you know, I just. I apologize. Uh, you know, what can I say? I, um, I've other than I 
I've made a mistake and I'm probably going to really pay for it. I, I didn't know at the time how badly I would, but, um, you know, for them, I, I thought they deserved an apology. Um, and then I guess how we, how we dealt with it as a, um, particularly Steve and I speaking, um, you know, we, we dealt with it, even though um, we could have done it a whole lot better. It came from a place that wanted to own the fact that we had tampered with, with the cricket ball. So, um, you know, from then and there, um, I guess we were, you know, you're going to wake up the next day and there's going to be scrutiny and um, there's going to be a lot of opinion um, and, and there's going to be, you know, a lot of, um, yeah, just a, a lot of media around, around what's happened. But, um, yeah, look, it's, it's, um, it was certainly one of the most difficult um, experiences that I've, I've been through, um, you know, dealing with the emotions personally, um, being under that, under, under the, that pressure, um, and then also um, moving forward with it, um, you know, holding on to all of the emotions, you know, that, that you're feeling, the, you know, the, you know, the guilt, the anger, um, you know, everything. So uh, it's, it's, it's quite complex, but, you know, that's what experiences are. Experiences are, are complex. And um, yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of great, um, a lot of great things that I've taken away from it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine like kind of, cause I think, you know, everyone's, experience those like you know someone you make a mistake and then you experience those you know feelings of guilt and shame like you know I, I certainly have in periods of periods of my life <laughs> to have like the whole country knowing about it and putting an extra microscope on it and making it I don't know probably literally a million times bigger and worse than it would be yeah I can't I can't imagine how <laughs> difficult that must be um and I think, yeah, every it's interesting how in in an incident like that is you know the public don't don't really ever think about that side of it. They'll think about they'll default to more like pointing the finger and you know quick quick to put people on a pedestal when things are going great for them, and then you know quick to jump on them when they're when they're not doing as as great. Um, but I guess so. How did you? That, how did you deal with that dynamic? Like you must have obviously seen that, you know, people were giving you a, like an incredibly hard time. Um, and whilst, you know, you, you came out and you admitted that you made a mistake, there's not, you know, there's not much more you can do in that incident than rather than, and, and just be like, look, I'm going to try and make up for this and be a better person from now onwards. But yeah, people are going to still bang on to you for never mind the next month or two, the next, you know, rest of your life, you'll maybe still get some booing, you'll still get people calling you a cheat. So like, how did, how did you find, how did you get to a stage where you could come to accept that and learn, or maybe it was something that you've always been good at, or how did you get to a point where you could actually feel comfortable internally again to, to progress with your life rather than having to just process guilt and shame constantly? I think that began really straight away. Um, whether you'd want to admit that or not, that process does start straight away. Um, it, it doesn't always feel like you take um, big steps forward, um, but it begins, it does begin straight away. And, um, you know, slowly but surely you, um, you know, for me, I pack up my bags, I get on a plane and I go home and, um, you know, I do a, I do a press conference. I, um, you know, I own the mistake that I made and, and then I walk out of that door and, you know, I sure as, you know, I, I do my, I do my best every day to try and, to try and move forward. And, um, you know, it's really simple. It, it starts with getting up in the morning. It starts with having simple routines and, um, and having, you know, good people and processes in place that allow you to, I guess, air, um, air all the, all the thoughts, all the emotions that that came with that traumatic experience. So um, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Um, you know, it's easy to to explain and talk about how I just did then. But um, you know how you know we're human beings. We feel things, and 
um, you know, at, at times they they aren't always always pleasant. Um, so, um, you know, that process was, you know, was was up and down. Um, there was certainly a lot of had days where, I, um, you know, I felt felt like I was going really well. I had days where I wasn't so so good. But I think the the more that journey went on, the more that I realised that, you know, I there were there were people fighting battles greater than what I was. And um, it's it's hard to understand at the time, but the truth is that people were. And um, you know, my head was just so focused on a bag of green and um, you know achieving all the things I wanted to in the game that sometimes you got to make a mistake like that to to open your eyes to to those um, possibilities. And um, yeah, but you know, I think that's that's what that's what trauma does. It's like a it's like if I cut myself. Um, you know, the body um, has a pretty magical way to, to heal itself. It, you know, creates a scar and, and you know, that, that scar tissue builds up to, to heal the wound. And, um, you know, emotional healing is, is much the same as well. Yep. So, yeah, just expand, just expand on that, really. I'm interested to, to hear about kind of so you, you get banned for, for nine months. Um, like, how was, how was it with the, the family in particular, like without, you know, going into too much detail, like obviously I can imagine, you know, someone, people like close to you, like your family, like did they take on, did you feel bad for, you know, putting some, um, some of that on them? Um, and then, yeah, talk beyond that in terms of like, you know, how those nine months panned out, like what, what, what you got up to and, you know, how it, how it went. Yeah, oh, I, you know, parents, um, I felt really bad for them. You know, they had cameras parked outside their house. Um, you know, I'm sure those journalists didn't want to be there, but it's the, it's the sad world we live in. So, um, you know, I, I felt, I didn't feel, feel great for them. So um, I guess you make plans to, um, yeah, you make plans to try, to try and combat that. But, you know, they... Um, you know, they, they definitely copped, copped um, a stiff end of the straw that they certainly didn't deserve. But yeah, I, I guess I, I was responsible for that. So um, yeah, and then, and then I guess from there, I, I just slowly tried to, tried to build. And, um, you know, I had, a, you know, had, had days, as I said before, where, you know, life was really, really good. But um, you know, I think as, as the weeks went on and, you know, I had, think I had weeks where I just felt like I was waiting for things to happen. But, um, you know, I realized that I had to actually, I actually had to do something. I had to, I had to show some, some action. So, you know, rather than just sitting, you know, sitting on my sorry ass in my chair at home or not knowing what to do, you know, waiting for some inspiration, waiting for some motivation, I actually had to get up and do something. And yeah, it was really uncomfortable to do, but um, it, it honestly is the only way. And, and that was one thing that I, you know, I realized that, you know, action actually led to, you know, all the motivation and all the inspiration that I needed. And, you know, from there, I, um, you know, I worked with our psych at the Wacker and, um, you know, we, you know, put together, a, um, you know, a lot of things that I wanted to, um, I wanted to achieve to, to better myself and, and go, um, and I guess go from there to, you know, to, to move forward um, and to become a better person from um, you know, a mistake that I made. And so talked, I've, I've seen that you, in those nine months, you did a bit, you did some like voluntary work and spent some time in, um, with, with, uh, in, in some camps, like helping some, some younger children um, that you've also kind of spoken about how yoga played quite a big part in that recovery process. So, yeah, can you just go into a little bit more detail on like some of those specific kind of tools or vehicles that kind of helped that recovery process, and what did it kind of open your eyes to, like at that time? I, yeah, so um, you know, yoga for me was a very personal experience. Um, you know, my mum actually suggested to me that I should um, I should go and practice. Um, I should go and practice lots um lots of yoga um and were you doing you know, yoga I, I had, the incident as well or 
Oh, certainly not, not to the uh, extent that I do now. Um, yeah. But I, um, I had, I had a really great experience with yoga um, at the academy, the cricket academy one year, um, probably my early twenties. Um, and it was about then that I started to really become interested in um, meditation and things like that as well. So I knew, I knew that was going to be a huge part of my healing, the healing of myself. But, um, you know, the, the practice of yoga, I just, I found it really therapeutic to be able to walk into class, you know, that particular day I felt something, you know, I felt heavy emotion about, you know, it might be a particular part of the memory of what happened in South Africa. It might've been something completely different. Um, and I found it therapeutic to be really specific to walk in and go, right, I've got this thought in my mind, um, you know, the next 60 minutes, I'm just going to just roll my mat out, breathe, you know, be the teacher, be in this room with other people sweating it out and, um, you know, probably or battling with the, you know, the same battles that I'm, I'm, you know, feeling in my own mind right now. Um, and, you know, when I would lay down at the end of class, I just felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, and then I'd roll up the next day and I'd, and I'd do it again. And then the next day after that, and, you know, I, I just became addicted and I could, I could feel the difference in inside me, what I was doing. And, you know, since then I, um, you know, I did teacher training um, when I was in Melbourne um, during that period of time. And, and that was, you know, that was massive, massive for me. So, you know, that, I think that was the journey yoga was and, um, and, and I, I did a lot of great, um, you know, charity based work or voluntary based work. Um, but probably the most impactful one was the work that I did with the Kyle Andrews foundation and behind me, like right there, there's a book and that's the, the camp book that, um, that you get from every year. So every year they, you know, they have a lot of staff there, um, volunteers that take photos and they basically put it together as a bit of a memory for, you know, the 18 or so kids that come up for the camp. And, um, you know, that was just, that was unbelievable. They, they go to Broome, um, every year. Um, and, um, their, their parents, the parents of the kids aren't able to, aren't allowed to come. The whole idea is for them to detach really completely from, from life in Perth and to hopefully, you know, enjoy the, the sun up in Broome and, um, you know, Broome's, North of Perth, probably a three hour flight. Um, and it's, you know, it's just so nice up there. There's a beautiful beach called Cable Beach up there. Kids stay at a camp school and, um, you know, businesses basically just donate their, their services to, um, you know, allowing the kids to have a, have a great time and um, getting to know some of those kids was, um, was incredible. You know, you're sitting at the, you know, like I'm, I'm sitting there, um, you know, sitting with my sports psychologist, not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's where I'm at. I'm sitting with my sports psychologist at the Wacker and, you know, where I'm dealing with the, um, you know, the, the emotional turmoil that I've just been a part of. Um, and they're sitting, you know, they're sitting around with each other and they're talking about their treatment, you know, and their cancer and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, it's truly is extremely humbling when you, um, you know, when you sit there and you listen to, listen to those sorts of conversations and, you know, the kids are so resilient and um, I learned a massive, I learned a massive amount and, um, you know, I've been able to make some unbelievable friendships with, um, you know, some great people in the foundation, but also some, some great kids. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, I guess it's become a, a bit of a, a passion of mine to, to, to be, to still be a part of, um, you know, what that foundation are, are trying to, trying to achieve. Awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I, I like, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I remember must've been what, so nine months when, when you came to the end of that nine month ban, um, there's a, there's an interview that you did with, with, um, Adam Gilchrist, um, which I actually remember watching at the time. And I was just kind of like, it struck me that it was it was a lot it was a much more sort of in-depth open 
honest interview from a sportsman that I'd that you'd normally hear. Like I think what's when often when you watch sports interviews, like you get the the set answers, you know, the the the, the box ticking, and the, there's a a tendency not to go into the real kind of honest depths of the mind and what what you're thinking. And I think that that really came across to me. And like anyone who I I recommend anyone to actually watch that, especially like now, like a cup a year or two on, like after that whole incident's passed. Like I think it, it was a really, really cool interview that. Um and you talked in that interview you talked quite a bit about this journey from you going from that desire to wanting to just fit into a culture to being true to yourself. And I think that that is a really big theme that I want to touch on because that's something that not, you know, just you have to deal with. Like that's something that everyone has to deal with to some extent. Um, I think like growing up and you know, I, I faced personally that like, I faced more of this like around sort of university and like coming out of university and wanting to get like a good career like in life and stuff and like there was this big sort of desire to to fit in really with my with my peer group and stuff um and then it was a process of, of actually no I want to be more true to myself more authentic and sort of in that journey um you learn a lot and you grew a lot and life became like richer in a lot of ways so yeah, just wanted to like ask you a bit more about that process that you went on. Like, where did the realization kick in that it was about becoming more true to yourself and being more, um, you know, making being true to your conscience, um, et cetera? And, like, and on a practical level, like, how did that change you as a person in, in that regard? Look, I'm I'm the I'm the type of person that um you know I, I want to know I want to know the answer what I want to know the answers why to things you know like you know why why am I here you know like why why am I here like what what's my purpose you know like people people don't think about those questions I, I do think about those questions so you know with um you know with the journey and you know my mistake that I made you know I look back and I go why did I do that. Like, why did I actually do that? And I know, you know, for some people that the answer is easy and it is, you're a fool. You, you did something dumb and you might be right, but why? Like, why did you do that? Like, really, why did you do that? And if you look hard enough and, um, you know, that's where yoga and meditation was so big for me because, you know, when you, when you um, allow yourself to, you know, to sit and be still with something and, as foolish as what that may be, you really do um, go deep into, you know, into your own mind and to your own thinking. So I, I, um, I just became, um, I, I've always been very open, you know, as you know, with the quirky things that I do and the things that I enjoy, but um, basically, um, you know, to, to, to make a mistake that I did, it was, it was about not being true to myself and, um, you know, we're all put into, we're all put in positions in life, um, where we need to make decisions and we need to make choices and, um, you know, what, what sort of place, what sort of place in mind is that decision coming from? And, and I think that's, um, and I think that's what I became, um, you know, really, really passionate about. Um, you know, I copped a little stick for that interview for wearing a singlet and things like that, but <laughs> honestly, I was being true to myself, like, that was where I was at. We did some filming at a yoga studio, like <laughs> where I did my teacher training and you know, like that was me. Like I, I was, I was quite, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I wasn't completely moved on, but I was certainly far more content with where I, where I was, where I was at at that point in time. And, um, and have you done it again, would you have just chucked a hoodie on just to, just to keep the, uh, <laughs> right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, like it's, I could have worn a suit and um, stuff like that. But at the time that was, that was the choice I made. So if I wasn't true to myself for, for that, then I'll learn, learn a great lesson. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's a great thing, but everyone, um, 
everyone looks to be to be better at is making decisions and choices that are that align to your values and that are true to yourself. Um, and and quite often we we don't we don't even know the answers to those questions. So um, you know, it's why self inquiry is is so important, um, and it's what I'm so inquisitive about. Awesome. And what do you like now, having gone through that experience? Like, you know, come over to come over to the UK. You just find yourself in a pub in Durham, um, and some some English bloke comes up to you and calls you a cheat or whatever they whatever they might do, or mentions you know sandpaper. Like, how, how do you how do you feel about that now? Like, how does that how does that sit with you? How do you process it? Like, how did you get to a stage where you can forgive those people, forgive yourself and just not, cause you don't, you don't seem like someone who is going to affect like really at all. Um, so yeah, just interested in like how you've got to, to that place. Um, well, look, I, when I, I know playing in the ashes last year, I, I didn't, um, <clears throat> I found it massively con- confronting um you know seeing the crowd in edge baston um you know behaving how they were um but you know what i i remember um yeah actually standing and slip with dave and steve and um um you know i think they were singing songs something along the lines of you know he's got um sandpaper in his pants or something or something along the lines of that and <laughs> And here's the amazing thing. It became funny. Like it actually didn't, it actually didn't like at, at the beginning it had, um, it had some charge to it, but it actually became funny. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's almost sometimes a little bit of, um, I think that's sometimes important with the mistakes that you make is to, you know, not like, you know, hysterically laugh about it, but you know, come to a point where I guess you're accepting enough to the point where you can, you can actually look back on it and go, you know, I, I did make a mistake, but, um, no one died. You know, like if I look at it now, you know, like do people, this, this could be taken completely out of context, but we're here right now, you know, it's COVID-19. There's, there's a lot of great problems in the world. Right now. Do people really care about, you know, like life, life does, life actually does move on. It doesn't excuse that, you know, a mistake that was made and it was ethically very wrong in the game of cricket. It doesn't excuse that, but yeah. life, life does move on. And, um, and, you know, at the time in the heat of battle with all the problems that we face in life, we don't, we don't think that, you know, we think that it's miserable and it'll last forever, but you know, it actually, it actually doesn't. So, um, and you know, it's easier said than done, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and does, has that sort of changed your perspective on good times v bad times in terms of like, right. do you look at that and go, actually, you're kind of glad that it obviously can be taken out of context again, but are you sort of glad it happened in terms of how it's affected you? You know, well, well I, I massively admire a lot of, um, I, I admire a lot of things in spirituality, in religion and things like that. And, you know, if you read a lot into, into, into yoga and, um, and things like that, you, you kind of realize that, you know, good moments and bad moments are both equally the same as each other. You know, we all want to feel good all the time, don't we? We want to feel great. We want to feel, um, we don't, we want to avoid feeling bad. But, you know, the truth is, is that like being able to be extremely level, no matter when good, good times or, you know, bad times are happening. That that's kind of part of the battle, and and I think that's the philosophy of of you know what I think I, I'd like to say that I try and model what's happened a little bit. Um, you know, in my life moving forward because um, yeah, it's not it's not saying that you're not grateful for for really really good moments or you know for for things happening to you or you avoid things and you just want to stay neutral. No, it's not saying that. It's just saying that accepting that in life there's going to be problems and. Yeah. Um, you're going to feel certain ways, but, um, you it's, know, I guess. Have, I was, was going to say, is that, have you looked into stoicism as well? Like, is that something that you've come across at all? Cause that, yeah, that, I actually have. Um, I've read quite a lot of um, 
Ryan Holiday stuff. He's quite big on stoicism. I've actually got a um, I've actually got a little medallion here next to my um, thing. It's got, it's got, it's got, it says more of farty on it, and I, th- I can't hundred percent. I can't hundred percent what it means. I th- it's something to do with loving, loving the sh- the shit that happens to you, basically. Yeah. And and on the back it's got a quote and it says he like fate. merely to bear what is necessary. Yeah, exactly. The love of fate, basically. Yeah. yeah. And on the back it says not merely to bear what is necessary, but love it. And and I think, um, you know, do I look back on you know my you know mistakes that I've made in my life and you know do I wish I made better decisions? Absolutely, you wish you made better decisions, but um, you know you would not be where you are. And and life doesn't throw anything at you that you can't you can't handle. And to have trust in that as a possibility is is very very difficult. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I, look, I, I love stoicism. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah really interesting what you say about the good and bad moments. And I, I what I take from what you were saying there is it's like your mind can prescribe like there's not good or bad moments in themselves like good of moments aren't good or bad with themselves it's kind of the meaning that you prescribe to them which is what's important and i think well what i've taken from some of the elements of stoicism is like you can either prescribe a a moment to be like this horrendous moment which is awful and that's it or you can prescribe a moment to be like a learning opportunity um, like a good a good thing or a learning opportunity and I think that's you know what yoga and meditation help you do is they like allow you to stay mindful mindful of every moment and keep prescribing the learning like how can I learn how can I learn how can I learn and keep keep making that self-inquiry question so that so that moments don't become just these shit moments that you can you can't get past and you have to avoid at all costs and the feelings of shame overcome you and all that kind of thing so i think your story is like a an extreme (laughs) embodiment of of that philosophy which i think is really really cool have you read this before probably one of the great stoics of all time i it's one of the books that i've i've bought and like it's on the shelf and i've like flicked into the first few pages and it's like yeah i've been told to read it a number of times i'm gonna read it but is that is that the place to start would you say great excellent book um and you can read it through very very slowly the chapters aren't very long but um you know like there's a bit in here and i'll read it marcus aurelius wrote this and it just shows you like people have fought the same battles for thousands of years and yeah. we just think it happens to us right now but you know covid19 we've this mistake has actually happened before and um you know so you know these these things come around and they happen but you yeah. know marcus used to wake up and he said um he wrote this in his journal he said say to yourself first thing in the morning Today, I shall meet people who are meddling, ungrateful, aggressive, treacherous, malicious, unsocial. All this has afflicted them through their own ignorance of true good and evil. Um, and, and he sort of goes on to elaborate on that as an idea. But just being able to accept this idea that, you know, people, you know, people and things are going to be thrown at you and they're not always going to be what you want. Yeah. Um, and, and I think stoicism is a great philosophy for for understanding that for sure 100 percent, 100 percent. be be the rock where the waves are just lapping up lapping up on the sides of you that's it yeah. so, uh, what's next what's next for you where, where i imagine so you couldn't come over to the uk because of of covid um to play for durham this summer but yeah what's next what's on the horizon and what do you what do you hope to get out of your cricketing career and 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 kind of without saying too grand like life like as in is cricket the biggest thing for you like when you look ahead or is it more you know is there things outside of cricket as well i have i think i have really good balance outside of cricket um you know i have lots of other things that i enjoy um so 
um, you know, from that point of view, that's, I think that's, that's, that's really, really important, but I still love cricket. I love playing. Um, it's, um, you know, the cricket has taught me so many great lessons, not just mistake that happened in South Africa, but you know, the, the game itself and um, dealing with, with failure and, and, and things like that. So uh, that's, um, that's something that I still want to continue to do. Hopefully I can get over to Durham next year and continue to do that. Um, the, you know, the isolation period, um, you know, it was fantastic. It actually gave so many, much time to reflect. And, um, yeah. you know, in that period of time, I've, um, with a couple of other teammates, we've looked to start up a, a business around sort of the well-being, mental health well-being um, type space. So, um, you know, I know that, um, you know, I know it's a huge impact on, on my life. Um, and, and I know all, all three of us, you know, we've got some great stories and great experience through that. So, you know, we want to share that to, to people. We're hoping to create some, um, you know, some challenges that people can do at home that allow themselves to, um, to really challenge, um, you know, to challenge the aspect of, of their life. And, um, you know, all three of us have had a lot of, um, a lot of experience in that. So, that's been a, a little focus on the side, um, you know, who knows what will happen there, but um, yeah, I'd say everything's just in back. Everything is, is where it needs to be right now. And, and that's, and I'm okay with that. Awesome. Well, it's been awesome to have those 11 rounds. Um, Jack, it's been main, it's been mainly you throwing, throwing most of the right hooks to be fair, but uh, <laughs> a couple back in with, with the stoicism chat, but uh but yeah, moving moving into the into the final round, um, there's just a a few sort of quick quickish fire questions that I, I kind of want to throw at you to uh, to round off the bout. Um, so the fir- the first one is other than other than Johnny Bairstow's head, um, what what is the most bizarre concept that's ever been thrown at you, um, that you that you've in the end found useful. Most bizarre concept that I found useful. Like something that you potentially, you know, would, would, if you look just at it at face value, like something like a yoga that you look at face value and go like, that's weird. Like, why would I ever do that? But then it's, it's kind of useful to you when you've kind of inquired a little bit further. Anything that sticks out? Um... Trying to, I'm trying to think if, if any of my teammates have kind of given me, given, oh, actually, I have something, but it's a bit, it's a bit, it's not, it's not what you think it would be. Um, so I don't know if they have these in the UK, but there's this, there's this juice bar called Boost Juice. Okay. And um, Ashton Agar, one of the players, um, one of my teammates in Perth, he loves boost juice and I love boost juice as well. Um, and he always used to do this thing and it was a bit disgusting. And like, until I gave him a try, I'm absolutely hooked every time now. So what you can do is you can buy, um, buy banana bread from boost. And there's a particular smoothie you can buy that's called banana buzz. And basically Ash would um, take a bite of his banana bread but then also take a massive swig of his banana buzz smoothie. And like he just said that there was all kinds of textures and stuff going on for him in his mouth. And, and I, I, I just thought that's not for me. Um, I can't do that. And then I tried it one day. This was <laughs> obviously no joke. It would have been about six years ago. And, um, because we would battle for smoothies in the nets. He would bowl to me like, you got me out. I had to buy him a smoothie and vice versa. And since then, yeah. I've been a changed man. Oh. So that's pretty bizarre, but <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable answer. Absolutely love it. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you're expecting that, but. Yeah, really thrown me. <laughs> I want to sort of end it all there, but. Uh, my second question is, if cricket wasn't your mission, um, I don't know, if you got an injury that meant you couldn't play cricket or whatever, what do you think you'd be doing now? Like, what, what would be your mission now? <laughs> I'd probably live in an ashram in India somewhere. Um, and 
meditate. <laughs> you were, you were and do yoga. I don't know. I th- I think I, I think any I think I would be just content <laughs> with spreading wherever that would be. Oh, I'm not sure I'd have the answer to it, but um you know, empowering people with, with strategies to be able to manage their own mental health and well being. I think that's that's something that I would I, I can see myself being a part of if, if cricket wasn't wasn't around. Yeah. I want to one day I want to come to Australia again and go visit like Ayers Rock. Have you have you been there? I haven't, no. Yeah. Well maybe I'll maybe I'll have to hit you up when I when I come over and we'll we'll do some you can we teach can go together. <laughs> you teach me some yoga. <laughs> yeah. Um, do it on top of Ayers Rock. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you think like just out of interest, do you think that there's a more of a movement like towards, you know, even in like pro cricket and pro sport? Do you think there's more of a movement towards people being more interested in this kind of, you know, almost like ancient wisdom, like yoga and um, stoicism and things of that regard? Or do you think that's just kind of you and that affects the people around you? I think people have a thirst for it because they're fascinated by the the greater meaning of what their life is and what their existence is. I, I think I generally think that that's why why people are interested in reading and, and learning about um, stoicism, about you know yoga philosophy and all these sorts of um, things. You know, religion. You know, it's 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 all um, it's all connected with this greater thirst for you know for people inquiring within and yeah. you know, I, I think a lot of sport a lot of sportsmen um you know some some do really connect with that an idea and and you know I, I genuinely believe it's because you're um you know you're under the spotlight so much that there's you know like a newspaper's not very grounding you know like being on twitter isn't isn't very grounding to be on there and and why because you know people go in there and they and they see things that affect them and they go this is this is crap like this doesn't serve me so people jump off it and um you know people people don't want to be a part of that and and they sit down and they think about life themselves in a sport and they kind of go like there's got to be more to this and and i generally think that's why people are, are fascinated about learning about all these things and you know, like stoicism is fantastic. You know, I, I love yoga and meditation and everything, um, you know, with, with that philosophy and, and um, you know, but ultimately all, all, of, all of culture and that field is, is really, it's, it's far more connected than you think. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And, um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that I think every human being, um, yeah, connects with. Yeah. yeah no it's just well said and um yeah i think it's cool like obviously you know a lot of pro sportsmen or you know pro cricketers would probably be less open to an interview like this so yeah <laughs> you know thanks for being open to it and you know not letting the ego get in the way i suppose but um how would uh my my penultimate question is um how would you like to be remembered Um, how would I like to be remembered? Hmm. How would I like to be remembered? What a great question that is. Um, good one for you. It's a good one for you. How how would I how would I like to be remembered? How would I like to be remembered? I just like to be remembered as Cameron Bancroft and whatever happens happens. Awesome. Like it. Mm. Um, and then the final thing is um, when you, when you come into the unboxing ring, rather than having an intro to the ring, you actually drop the mic and, and you have a, you have a track that plays you out. So um, I'm interested to know what this track would be and why is it, is it the song that was playing in your head as a, as a 13 year old cricketer or is it something different? Um, 
Oh, what's the track that I'd have play out? Uh, look, I, I'm a huge, I'm a huge Coldplay fan, and um, one of my favourite song that they perform is "Yellow." So, if you could play that track out for me, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Will do. Will do. Cam, awesome to talk to you, mate. Um, it's been been really, really cool, and um, yeah, I'm sure people will really like getting that yeah further insight into what you've been through and um, how it's all played out. Thanks for having me, Harry. Appreciate it, mate. Awesome. Speak to you soon. Yes. Yeah.